Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on what part of the country you're in. Welcome to the Supporting Descendants Who Are Saving Their Historic Places session at Pass Forward 2022. My name is Omar Eaton Martinez. I'm the Senior Vice President for Historic Sites here at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And before we launch into everything, I just wanted to do a quick introduction of our three panelists. We have Chief Ben Barnes, who is the Chief of the Shawnee Tribe. He'll be talking to us about his descendant preservation work around the, the story of the Indian boarding schools and the impact of, uh, of all those things on his, on, his, on his people as well. We're gonna talk to Yamona Pierce, who is the founder of the Hamilton Hood Foundation, who has uh, done some research on her genealogy and traced her descent to discover that she's connected to the folks who are laid at rest at Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. So she'll talk to her about her story as a descendant, uh, as a descendant, and as a preservationist. And then lastly, we'll have Nancy Ukai, who is a writer and researcher and founding member of the Wakasa Memorial Committee, and she'll be telling the story of the Japanese uh, incarceration and the preservation of the Wakasa Monument. And so we'll talk about all those three stories here today. With my opening remarks, I just wanted to. Uh, allow us to set the tone a little bit here. I think that we understand fully the importance of descendants and the agency that they should have in telling the full American story in all of our sites. Not just our trust sites, but all of the sites across the country and arguably globally. There's been a phrase that's been uttered um, in different contexts over the years, but I'd like to evoke today, and that's nothing, without, nothing about us without us. And it's a phrase that's borrowed from the activists who seek justice for our disabled or differently abled brothers and sisters, but it's absolutely a tenet that all of us who seek to tell the full American story should stand on. If we look at the rubric that was created back in 28, uh, 2018 uh, by the James Madison Montpelier Historic Site with the funding of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, which is part of the National Trust. There's a rubric called Interpreting Slavery. In its most fundamental form, when we talk about the definition of a descendant community, it's a group of people whose ancestors endured trauma. And certainly there was trauma and enslavement and incarceration and in these Indian boarding schools that we'll learn about today. These descendant communities, um, Definitely, uh, we can talk about these in a way that transcend their uh, the limited definition of a genealogical connection, because we know that they also can include ancestors who were not only enslaved, uh, incarcerated, or forcibly removed from a particular side of the region, but also the families or community ties that are connected to those sites. So a descendant community can also welcome those who feel connected to the work that that institution is doing whether or not they know of a gene genealogical connection. So it's important for us to kind of be rooted in what a descendant is, what a descendant community is, and how these three wonderful activist preservation, uh, preservationists have, have really leaned into their work today. And so without further ado, I'm going to ask Chief Barnes to start his opening presentation. Chief Barnes. Ben Barnes, Wanuki. Good day, good morning. I am Ben Barnes, I'm Chief of the Shawnee Tribe. And today I greet you from Sacramento, California, where I'm attending the National Congress of American Indians. 574 nations from around the United States gather each every year to talk about our issues. And I'm here to give testimony about boarding schools and the, and the consequences of the United States boarding schools policy. So it's very apropos that I greet you today from the National Congress of American Indians. The Shawnee tribe occupied 26 uh, states across the eastern half of the U.S. If you go to the next slide, please. Our history spans a, almost half a millennium from the historic era where Shawnee people encountered Hernan de Soto in the American Southwest in 1540. After the passage of the American Civilization Act of 1819 and subsequently the Indian Removal Act of 1830, Shawnees began to find themselves moving westward, ultimately arriving in northeast Kansas, near Kansas City, Kansas. The American Civilization Act 
sought to uh, remove the Indian from Indian children and and destroy our cultures and communities. And missionaries were deployed and funds were taken from the Shawnee, 2,000 acres were taken from Shawnee peoples and Shawnee monies were paid for the, for the materials and the labor that ended up constructing what was to become the Shawnee Indian Manual Labor School. Next slide, please. The Shawnee tribe has collaborated with the state of Kansas as we survey the three remaining buildings that stands to come up with an action plan to repair these buildings. The foundations are crumbling. As seen in this picture, you can see that there's daylight coming through the roof. Currently, those three buildings that stand, they are the oldest buildings in Kansas, with the exception of the Rookery at Fort Leavenworth. But only one of these three remaining buildings is open to the public. We believe that the investment that the Shawnee has significant investment of research on the site, how best to have a historic structure report, how to repair these sites with, with the materials. We can get these buildings back to the standards that they need to be on. This site is a national landmark on the National Registry. And if you could go to the next slide. Currently, exhibits at the, at the uh, one building that's open to the public contain no content from Shawnee people or from the other indigenous uh, uh, children from other tribal nations that attended the school. What we hope to do is rehabilitate some of the exhibits as seen in this picture. This is from the earliest part of the 20th century. It's not even from the time, er this, this photo is not even from the area era of Shawnee people attending the boarding school. We hope to have a full story told of what those children endured. We hope we would like to see interpretation exhibits created that look at the historical documents, the letters that were authored by the Shawnee, but as well as the, Shawnee, as the Shawnee's neighbors at the Baptist Mission and the Quaker Mission. The Shawnee Indian Manual Labor School was managed under contract by the United States with the Methodists to uh, remove our children from our communities so that they might become, quote, American citizens. So next slide, please. So we're hopeful that with our support, our resources, this research we've done thus far will allow us to repair the remaining structures at the Shawnee Indian Manual Labor School and that these buildings will be a monument, a testament of the survival of the Shawnee tribe, our languages, our culture, and our communities. Niwa Nkoch Chaye. Thank you. Back to you, Armar. Thanks. What an incredible narrative that we really have to lean on as Americans to understand uh, the, the negative and horrible impact that these boarding schools have. And, um, and, and I look forward to learning some more so that we can continue to tell the full American story. Next up, we have Yamona Pierce, who's the founder of the Hamilton Hood Foundation. Please come forth and uh, tell us your story. Hello and good afternoon. I am Yamona Pierce. I'm founder of the Hamilton Hood Foundation, and my presentation today will highlight the Remembrance Project, as well as my preservation journey at the historic Pierce Chapel African Cemetery, located in Harris County, Midland, Georgia. And it is one of the oldest burial grounds of enslaved Africans in Harris County, Georgia. Next slide, please. My decade began with my preservation journey began with two decades of genealogical research. This research allowed me to time travel, to connect with my past people and places, and ultimately the discovery of Pierce Chapel African Cemetery, the final resting place of my third great grandparents and one of the oldest burial grounds of enslaved Africans in Harris County, Georgia. Next slide, please. This is a street view of Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. Um, early in 2019, my family and I discovered uh, Pierce Chapel African Cemetery again doing genealogy research and decided to travel uh, to Georgia to pay our respects, to retrace the footsteps of um, our ancestors. 
um, we met up with a third um, cousin, uh, my cousin Sarah, who's 93 years old, and asked her if she would show us the location of Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. Well, she did. Um, and when we arrived, uh, as you can see, um, it doesn't have any uh, clearly, uh, it's not clearly defined where the cemetery ends or begins. Um, there is no signage and it is hiding in plain sight. Would you please play the video? This video uh, gives us a different perspective, an aerial uh, view of Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. It shows two cemeteries side by side of similar age, one that has been preserved, uh, it has its history recorded and documented. Uh, the descendants have access to the cemetery. Uh, and Pierce Chapel African Cemetery, of course, about 60 paces from uh, the other cemetery with it history uh, not being documented, um, no signage and hiding in plain sight. The creek that you saw um, on the video, uh, it's Flat Rock Creek. That creek was a baptism site um, at the border of Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. This slide shows um, history erasure at Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. African American cemeteries are cultural heritage resources and they are non-renewable. Uh, Pierce Chapel African Cemetery has been impacted by the development of overhead power lines and cable lines. That being said, it is important that companies that serve communities uh, coexist in these communities, that they integrate policies and practices within their companies that include cultural heritage perspectives. Next slide, please. This slide shows um, the archeological bur burial site survey that was done at Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. We've worked closely with an archeological firm to um, do the survey and to identify the burial sites, to identify the cultural um, attributes and elements, uh, as well as archeological artifacts at Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. The pink flags that you see on this slide um, identify the burial sites at Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. And according to the archeologist, there are not less than 500 burial sites at Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. Um, thus far, we have completed um, the the archaeological burial site survey. We have um, had cadaver dogs come out to Pierce Chapel to further investigate um, sites that have been identified. We have completed ground penetrating radar um, to locate additional burial sites. And we've also included LIDAR drone technology to identify area, areas um, that you simply um, can't see on a map and um, areas that may be of concern uh, throughout our preservation project with the Remembrance Project. Next slide, please. We were successful in uh, lobbying uh, for the removal of the utilities, um, power, and broadband cable lines at Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. Um, the slide to your to my right, uh, your right, actually shows what um, the uh, open area where the lines were previously installed, what that area looks like now. Next slide, please. This slide shows a few of the headstones that can be clearly seen at Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. There's a ledger stone uh, to the left and a handcrafted uh, slate box tomb on the right. Next slide, please. 
These pictures show what the landscape looks like at Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. It is a landscape of celebration and enslaved people uh, in the United States held on to their traditional African culture in many ways um, through song, religion, soil cultivation, and even when laying family members to rest. These expressions of funerary art displayed on the screen can be traced back to the Asante peoples of West Africa and modern day Ghana. Their belief in death uh, and afterlife has played a very important role um, in funerary rites and how a beloved family member is memorialized. Uh, we have the head of a hoe um, in the upper left box. We have a white pottery vase in the upper right. Um, there is an amethyst vase in the lower left um, corner of the screen, as well as a white quartzite marker and an amethyst vase on the lower right hand side. Next slide, please. This is an extension of the traditional uh, practices, West African practices. We have periwinkle on the left-hand side and uh, yucca on the right-hand side of the screen. Next slide, please. Our preservation work at Pierce Chapel African Cemetery um, includes days of service where we um, um, engage descendants, the descendant community, as well as the, um, our, the community at large, our community partners. Uh, the benefits of having this approach to um, preservation creates opportunities for us to connect more with the, the descendants and uh, the broader community. It also helps us to connect more with our history um, uh, in ways that um, we can educate the youth that come and participate with us. Our aims with the Remembrance Project at Pierce Chapel is to make this historic and culturally significant space more visible um, in the historic and cultural landscape of Harris County, Georgia, so that uh, not only the descendants, but the broader community can come and learn more about the lived histories, the legacies of those that have been laid to rest at Pierce Chapel, and so many that have played a vital role in making the community what it is today. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Yamona, thank you so much for <clears throat> really laying out all the different things that you had to do to get it to where it is today. Anything from completing ground penetrating radar to lobbying for the removal of utilities. Uh, we, we appreciate your work and your sacrifice. And we understand this is not for the faint of heart, uh, but I know that our communities will be blessed um, as a result of your good and hard work. Next up, we have Nancy Ukai. Please come forward and tell us your story. Thank you, Omar, um, and thank you for these previous presentations about buried histories, erased histories. Um, I'm coming to you from Berkeley, California, um, although my presentation today will, about, will be about an incarceration camp in Utah. And um, my parents, my mother lived near the San Francisco Bay in Berkeley, and when she was a child, they uncovered Ohlone artifacts, a mortar and pestle in the front yard. So I think our family has always been aware of the dispossession of peoples and that when we're on lands, in this case, I'm on Ohlone land here, um, there are stories bef that came before us. So today I'd like to talk about um, the Wakasa Memorial in Topaz, Utah. I'm a founding member of the Wakasa Memorial Committee. Um, it's a group of Japanese American survivors and descendants of a World War II um, prison camp in central Utah. The name of the camp is Topaz, and 12 of my relatives, including my parents and grandparents, were incarcerated there for 12 for three years, living behind barbed wire and um, under the armed watch of guard towers. And this photograph here shows the barracks. Um, it's in a camp that's south of Salt Lake City by two and a half hours. Next, please. <clears throat> 
So in the spring of 1943, 125,000 Japanese immigrants who were not able to be naturalized by law and um, American citizens were rounded up from the West Coast and placed mostly in 10 um, remote concentration camps in the United States. And my parents, as I just said, went to Utah. And in the spring of 1943, just five months after entering, an immigrant man named James Wakasa, who was walking his dog by the barbed wire fence, was shot through the heart by a, by a watchman. He died immediately parallel to the fence. But within hours, the government whitewashed the story and said he was trying to escape. The next day, um, immigrant friends made a detailed map of the location of his death. And in this slide, you can see that the watchtower is circled in red and the spot where Wakasa died, um, they even colored in, they showed where the blood spot was, um, is shown on this hot hand-drawn map. There's 943 feet or 315 yards between the guard tower and the place where Wakasa died. That's three football fields. The guardman was a crack shot. So I found this diagram in the National Archives several years ago. Next, please. <clears throat> the imprisoned people wanted to build a monument at the death spot to Mr. Wakasa, but they were denied by authorities, but they built one anyway. And it was called impressive in, according to government records. Within days, the memorial, however, was ordered demolished and government records say that no trace was left of it. In 2020, two archaeologists took the map, which I had published on a website, and they went to Utah. They miraculously found the top of the Wakasa Monument peeking above the earth. The prisoners had not destroyed the memorial, it turns out, but they had buried it instead. That monument had laid buried for 78 years. And in this slide here, you can see the arrow pointing to the top of the monument. So here is the top sticking three inches above the ground, unnoticed for decades. A small group of us who had been following this um, were talking about it and there was shock, joy, and the feeling that our ancestors had led this message of grief, outrage, resistance, and remembrance for us. Um, and this, because this was a World War II murder that our parents had talked about. My mother used to talk about it at dinner time and. I just remember how emotional she got and how angry she was that this elderly man, he was 63, was walking his dog and, and killed. So after the discovery, a committee of um, experts from the National Park Service, descendants um, such as me, and the local Topaz Museum Board was formed. It was a 14 member committee um, and the Topaz Museum Board had opened a museum about the camp several years before, um, 16 miles away. The Topaz Camp, by the way, is a National Historic Landmark. So the archaeologists on this 14-member committee said, leave the monument in the ground. A lot of survey work has to be done. Um, but nine months later, without telling Japanese-American survivors or descendants or informing archaeologists, the Topaz Museum Board unearthed the monument. Um, next, please. Um, they used a forklift and a chain and um, descendants and survivors were only told after this terrible desecration had occurred. This photo was taken by the Utah State Historic Preservation Office, which actually the board had invited to attend a week earlier, even though they didn't tell us, the descendants and survivors. In this photograph, you'll see um, a camera on the left-hand side, and there's also a small one perched on the um, hole where the, the monument was dug out from. And so our committee is now trying to um, view this this um, video, which is two hours, apparently 30 minutes of digging, hand digging around the, um, the stone and another 90 minutes of dragging it out of the hole. So if there was an inscription on the surface, it might've been destroyed. And certainly the archeological evidence was permanently destroyed by the manner in which they pulled it out of the earth. So our committee of survivors and descendants immediately formed. Um, we wrote a letter to the Topaz Museum Board, which is the legal steward of the property because they own it. And we proposed six steps to move forward. The National Trust for Historic Preservation learned about our case through social media 
and has supported our advocacy. And we're, you know, we're lay people. We're passionate about preserving our historic site, um, our historical artifacts, our cultural heritage and the stories, but we're not experts in archeology span and preservation. So the trust has been a tremendous ally in the face of resistance from the museum board to our um, committee request for collaboration. And it's also um, sessions like today where we can hear other stories and learn that these cases of erased history and, um, and advocacy by survivors and descendants is so important. Next, please. So this is the site one year after the removal of the monument. The circle shows where the monument was dragged out of the earth and the hole was filled with black backfill. Um, it still remains in that condition today, which is untouched and it's pretty traumatizing to go there. This photograph was taken in July to see that nothing has been done. The X marks the spot where Mr. Wakasa would have died, would died um, on his back. Um, the photograph in the right hand, um, upper right hand shows the monument. It's sitting on a construction pallet and a soiled piece of carpet because that is what the forklift driver laid the monument on after it was pulled out of the earth. It's five feet tall and it's a thousand pounds. And even the archeologists who rediscovered the top were surprised at how large it was, which calls into question, how did these immigrant people um, place it? Where did they find it? Um, what was the orientation of it? It was um, because it was the way it was taken out. A lot of these kinds of questions were not able to really know right now. Um, the last, the picture on the bottom shows a ceremony that our committee held one year after the desecration. And what we did is we tied hand folded paper flowers, each with the name of someone who died at the camp, 139 people. And we tied them to the barbed wire fence, which is original from the guard tower to the point where Mr. Wakasa died. And we all walked, retraced the steps which symbolized the flight of the bullet and also um, the, the, the walk of the archeologists who rediscovered this monument. Um, next, please. So we're now advocating for survivors and descendants to lead discussions about where the monument should finally be, be placed um, and how to memorialize the site. Um, there's just so much to talk about. And frankly, the museum board has claimed that their position as the stewards of the site gives them the privilege of making these decisions. And we as survivors and descendants obviously want to be at the table and lead these discussions. And um, this brings up the question of who tells history, what stories are told, um, how are they told and interpreted? And so as we think, we're still far away from talking about how the monument and the site um, will be memorialized. And luckily, um, because of our advocacy, we were able, we've been able to start discussions led by the Utah State Historic Preservation Office and attended by the National Park Service, the board and survivors and descendants. Um, we're going to be able to protect the monument over the winter by retrofitting a shed um, that will be placed over it. And also um, are discussing about how to preserve or at least protect the memorial site by laying a geotextile over it and laying sediment on top of it so that it won't face another winter of erosion. Um, at, the meantime, at the same time, we're also thinking about how we as survivors, descendants, and people who are interested in protecting the civil rights monument, which is not just representing our camp that my parents went to, but all the World War II incarceration sites. And in fact, the buried histories that are lay under the ground in our country, how do we memorialize this site? And Omar had suggested that we think about a quote um, to help us think about this. And I wanted to share this one. When you build a memorial, you cannot merely build that thing in isolation, but must repair the world around it and within it so that the larger world at that one place becomes more coherent and more whole. Thank you very much. Incredible story. Uh, thank you so much for you know, sharing your heart that way. And um, it really goes to show that you know what Marcus Garvey said many years ago still holds true today that 
a people without the knowledge of their past history is like a tree without roots. And so that's why it's so important the work that you three are doing is to reestablish those roots in, in a certain way and nurture them and help them grow. Uh, we know that erasure is a tool of, of white supremacy and othering in a way that we have to combat it with evidence and with love and with perseverance. And I'm just really grateful for all three of you and the presentations you gave. I'm gonna launch into the next section of our session and begin asking some discussion questions. But as a reminder to the attendees who are online, please share your questions if you have not already in the chat box and we'll hopefully incorporate some of those questions as well. And so I'm gonna go ahead and start us off with this first question. I'll start with to Barnes. You know, again, I have a very much, I'm very sensitive to the, all things that deal with erasure. And so, uh, you know, that's what inspires me to do this work. But as a descendant, Chief Barnes, what motivates you? What inspires you to protect historic places associated with their community, history, and culture? And why do you even, why do you bother to preserve these places? Well, for myself, I didn't start out wanting to be a chief of the Shawnees or one in political office. I f there was a need in my community and that need was language preservation. And my brother and I, we always thought, we always assumed there would be elders that would handle teaching our language to our kids and our grandkids. We always thought they'd be available. And then one day we found ourselves in a position, there was no elders, they were, they were gone. They went to the next world. And so my brother and myself said, you know, we're gonna start teaching the tribe's language. And once we started teaching language, we realized we didn't get here accidentally. It was, it was there was a pogrom to remove the language from us that the uh, erasure of our civilization who we were who they who we who we our self-determination on becoming the people that we dreamt to be was taken taken from us during the 19th the 7th the 18th 19th and even the 20th century and that it was up to us to restore language and so it's these boarding schools these places we this this site that we have in kansas city kansas is a beautiful site on 12 acres the original 2,000 acres, that's all it's left now is 12 acres where three buildings were made. And if you drive by it, everything looks fine until you start examining the buildings, you see the foundations are crumbling. There's uh, uh, bad roofs, there's uh, daylight coming through and you can actually see, you can see the outside from the inside the attic and it's in terrible shape. And we want the buildings to be monuments of survival. When we go to Washington DC or elsewhere, we visit these monuments to pay homage to them the things that people went through, whether it's the Vietnam Wall, or whether it's the Lincoln Memorial. For this place, the Shawnee Indian Manual Labor School, it was a work camp for children, Shawnee children. And that it was at this place that we survived. It was at this place, in spite of the things done to us, we still have our language, we still have our culture, we still have our tradition, and we're still a coherent people and community with multiple communities spanning 50 states. So I very much feel that this place is as sacred as any monument. What a power, that's a great story of resilience. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. Yamona, what motivated you to do this work? Uh, thank you for that question, Omar. Um, you know, my journey began with uh, two decades of genealogy research, uh, and I've always felt a great deal of kinship to my ancestors. Um, preserving these historic and culturally significant places um, helps us to create a formal foundation to where we can document and interpret the lived histories, um, the experiences of our ancestors, ancestors, and to ensure that the preservation work authentically conveys those lived histories. Um, historic places such as Pierce Chapel are a testament to the lives and um, our collective history. And the protection of the landscape and artifacts are but one facet of the preservation. These sacred places give rise to the importance of our unique history and cultural traditions, values, and reflect the community that extends from our ancestors. Awesome. You know, it's uh, it's so it's such an important thing to really uplift the ancestors and show those connections and empowers us. And it really just is the first place I go to to combat a lot of the lies that, you know, we all grew up with in terms of some of the American exceptional stories that we 
we're indoctrinated with in our in our in our school systems. But Nancy, I'd like to hear from you as well. Like, what drove you to this important work? Um, well, frankly, I had been um, researching. The Topaz Museum opened in 2017, and I had been researching um, the death of Wakasa, which some historians, when they reviewed the narrative that was going to go up, you know, on the walls of the museum, said, "Oh, his story wasn't adequately told," and. Um, I just, it was part of my childhood history, my memory of my mother becoming so upset and saying they didn't have to kill him, he was deaf. Well, it turns out that he wasn't deaf and it was part of the distortion of his life and his death that um, I began to learn about in the National Archives when I uncovered documents saying that this monument had been built, but it, there's no trace left, that he was fighting for um, the rights of the prisoners to get payment from unemployment in California, um, that he was an immigrant cook from Japan, and he became a real person, in other words. And when it turns out that this, uh, so I wrote this article about the what I call the demolished monument in 2020, and that was um, when Confederate statues were being torn down, people were out in the streets protesting the murder of George Floyd. And I thought, here's a monument that once existed, um, but it doesn't anymore. It was too dangerous to exist. Who has the power to build monuments? Why was this monument destroyed? So when I posted the map on this website, 50 Objects, that um, the National Park Service funds and that I'm working on to elevate the World War II stories through artifacts, Two archaeologists later went took the map and discovered the top. So that mobilized people and went, oh my gosh. And it just was a re-traumatization when the board lifted it out the way they did without telling us so disrespectfully with construction machinery. And then yeah. the year has been um, has gone by and without being able to be at the table to discuss how to handle it in the future. And so we're still in this um, fight. And um, it's 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 been pretty pretty traumatizing, um, but also a way for people to connect and for us to connect here. So I'm so grateful for this opportunity. I'm glad you said that, Nancy, because for me, what made this session so powerful was the fact that we were able to talk about these stories from the perspective of different demographics. Uh, sometimes we lean in on one affinity over another for some natural reasons. But I think there's a lot of power in learning about each other's struggles, right? I mean, you guys have all different, had all different types of barriers and struggles and doing the preservation work you're doing. And I'm hoping that we can start building coalition around this work so we can really support each other and have some, see some sustainable change within our lifetime. It would be great. Uh, I'm going to go to the chat and for the attendees, if you're wondering, I'm not exactly going in order. I'm kind of grabbing the different questions that I see that I think are really, really um, pertinent. Um, I'm going to read what Lillian Weinert said. Uh, she wrote, how do we incorporate these important stories into school curriculum? Um, does the National Trust for Historic Preservation advocate within the Department of Education our resources for partnering with state education departments? Um, so she knows, she understands, and acknowledges the long process to change and adapt curriculum. But I want to learn how to make that impact so that future generations learn, understand, honor, and discuss the truth of our country. So I'm gonna, I want to ask you three, um, and this time I'll start with Yamona. How do you think we can incorporate these important stories into school curriculum? Well, I tell you, um, that's a good question, especially given what's taking place um, around the country and certain states with uh, the denial and dismissal of uh, certain parts of our history. Uh, I think we can continue to work alongside um, historic preservationists to navigate um, these local, state, and federal agencies um, to ensure that these stories do not go untold. No, thank you for that. You wanna, what, do you, what do you think about it, Nancy? Um, I think we first of all have to collect the facts mm. about the history. Um, and, and from there, um, hopefully put it into curriculums in schools, being aware of the standards and being aware that legislatures in different states kind of piecemeal 
um, even though some are trying to suppress what they call, you know, critical race theory and they're misrepresenting it. Um, Illinois, for example, recently passed legislation to mandate Asian American history. Um, yeah. So that's a positive move. That is a positive move. What do you think, Ben? What we have done is we've worked with our allies at the uh, National Indian Education uh, Office, as well as the White House's liaison with Native Indi Education. But I really think it's important to instill and allow for descendant communities to have uh, occupy these sites and these places so that we tell the stories but also what we've done is take take that message on the road you know go into places like shawnee indian or the shawnee mission high school and give presentations about our history in the area because for a lot of people they think this is a pretty dog park and they don't even understand that this was a child this was a, a re-education center the same kind of re-education center that we're talking about uyghurs in china that happened here in the united states hmm. so it's important that we invest in uh, invest in opportunities for descendant communities to be part of the storytelling process. You know, you mentioned at the very beginning, nothing about us without us. Absolutely, absolutely. And and, and I would say, in, in my experience, I mean, I've been with the National Trust for a few months now, so I'm not, I don't have a lot of specific examples with the trust doing that yet, but I'm sure some of my colleagues who are helping me here uh, with this session will pop some examples in the chat but I will tell you that I know in other agencies that I work with, what we've done was we work with social, local social study standards. And usually in, um, in state level um, tests, you have, to, you have to do this document-based questions and they have to be able to use their critical thinking skills to discern their answers based on the questions and the Socratic, a Socratic piece, which is usually a picture of an historic site or some type of object or maybe a quote from someone. And so I think if there's ways to um, get your site, your objects, your narratives, even with quotes as Socratic pieces of these document-based questions, then you'll be able to really start to see some impact and how uh, you can start changing curriculum. Because if it's a required test, that means they have to learn it in order to pass and get their degree. OK, so I think we have a specific question here for Yamona. Um, can you talk more about the use of cadaver dogs at the Pierce Chapel African Cemetery site? Did you partner with the local police department? Um, uh, th thank you. That's a very good question. So um, we did not partner with the local police department. However, the organization that we used, um, the owner, worked with the Georgia Bureau of Investigations for, I think, over 25 years, and she handled the cadaver dogs within that organization. We um, resourced um, this organization because the archeological firm that we use indicated that there were burials that needed, um, or sites um, that needed further investigation. And um, we should use all resources available, including cadaver dogs. Uh, the cadaver dogs came out and they um, searched um, or um, evaluated the uh, inside and outside perimeters at Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. And they did um, identify positive findings. Um, the same areas that were identified by the, the archeologists. Um, the cadaver dogs can pick up scent. The way that they identified these sites is that they picked up a scent and that scent is only um, unique to a burial that has not been preserved. And mm -hmm. so, right. And so with that, once they identified the location, picked up the scent, those areas were um, put into a GPS coordinate and included on a map for Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's, that's incredible. For those of you who are in, in that mode, preserving your sites. You know, this is a, that's some great detailed information for you to hopefully um, use on your sites if, uh, if you need something like that. Uh, I wanted to read a, a comment that was directed to Nancy uh, from Emily Lawson, who said, thank you so much for your presentation and good work. My Japanese American mother-in-law, her siblings and parents were incarcerated at Minidoka and Crystal City. They were separated from their father, who was a minister at the Seattle Betsuin Buddhist Temple. So I just wanted to share that with you. 
And um, can I just mention following please. up on this piece about the cadaver dogs? Of course. Um, this is an example of something that we descendants are, and survivors are learning about, which is that Mr. Wakasa was cremated in Ogden, Utah after the funeral. Um, but no one knows what happens to his happened to his ashes. And one speculation was, could one of the people who buried the monument thrown in some of the cremains? Um, and archaeologists said there are technologies which allow you to detect that. So it wouldn't be cadaver dogs because in Yamona's case, this is you know a different case of um, cremains. But um, these are the kinds of things that preservationists are helping us with, which we're so grateful for. No, that's amazing. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing how science can help us with uh, with this very much deeply humanity-driven project. Uh, this to goes to show you that these disciplines that we've always been taught are, are not separate. They're, they're intertwined, uh, especially when it comes to people of color, I find. Um, so I'm going to start this question off with uh, Chief Barnes. How do you recommend organizations and people who are not made up of descendants or survivors to best serve as allies to those local communities? How best can we approach these difficult topics without seeming ingenuine? Well, as, as Nancy and Yamona was just visiting about cadavers, I was thinking about the nature of this very meeting with National Trust, given a platform, given a panel, creating opportunities. Because here in Yamona and Nancy talk about cadaver dogs, as we, the Shawnee tribe, is, are uh, beginning our search for our kids. Yep. Uh, you know, now, you know, I've, we've, this technique of cadaver dogs is new to us. We haven't heard it. But meanwhile, we're working with scientists as archaeologists through Section 106 of the Historic Preservation Act and with the National uh, Park Service and visiting with them about uh, how are we going to do GPR magnetometry search for bodies. And so Yamona and I connected and we you know, talked about her search and our search. And whether it's Nancy's story, Yamona's story or my story, our community stories. This is really all the same story, really, right? I mean, we're all, we're just, we're, we're trying to reclaim a piece of our pages of our history and say, no, we need to be the ones to investigate and interrogate these documents and these stories and this, these pages of history. We need to be ones to be included in discussions. We need to be included in your research designs. And as you said, Omar, whenever we were talking about these issues, these are not, they don't live in silos, they're interdisciplinary. So creating an opportunity for people to come together and have conversations, I think there's some synergies and power from that, that that's not really that's not really apparent. So just platforming people, giving them a megaphone, the opportunity to speak, I think that's very powerful. Anyway. I think I think thank you for that, Chief. I think I will tell you that if this session serves as anything, this serves as a platform or a springboard for building coalition around this movement, then we win. So let's let's continue to to keep these questions coming and hopefully we can connect on the platform um, that we have established through the National Trust here and continue these conversations beyond what we have in this 60 minutes. Yamona or Nancy, did you want to respond to that question also? Well, I would just like to um, say that um, me meaningful changes are needed in um, aspects of historic preservation and whomever these allied organizations uh, might be. Um, it would be wonderful um, if they would um, work alongside the descendants um, to help uh, create um, descendant-centric um, policies and practices and um, advocate with the descendants when interpreting these sacred spaces uh, to ensure that they authentically convey um, the heritage, the histories, the lived experiences of um, our ancestors um, and the values of, of the community. Thank you. Nancy? Um, Omar, I wanted to pick up what you said about education and objects. And, you know, objects are obviously physical evidence that something happened. And it's so important to preserve them, which is why the desecration of them or the mishandling of them is so painful. Um, and I think that by allowing these objects not only to learn about them materially and the stories and the cultural meaning um, connects us and also it breaks a silence about the history. And, um, and, and so I was gonna just say thank you to Emily for talking about her family history, 
what this Wakasa monument has done for us is not only point out that the immigrants, because they mostly spoke Japanese, their story is the least told. And yet here's this 1,000 pound thing that is their voice. And um, it's bringing not only us together here, but also other um, members of our community who were after the war dispersed and became a diaspora. Our communities were broken up. So um, objects speak. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. So one of the, uh, you know, we, we're, we're, we're definitely starting to uh, crystallize this idea of coalition building through um, shared oppressions and, 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 and different barriers that affect all of us. Um, one of the questions that was posed by one of the attendees, Emma Lang, she says, this is a transnational question. All of these topics and issues are also being discussed, discussed in Canada. And, um, and she wondered if the panelists have been connecting across the border. As an American living in Canada, she's a strong believer that we're stronger when we work across the border when working on these sadly controversial and very complicated issues. So my question to either three of you, have you worked with anybody across um, borders? And I guess the implication here is outside of the United, what we call the United States, or have you considered it if you haven't? Go ahead, Omar, Chief. We, we currently are actually. We, uh, we attended the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And so we connect with our brothers and sisters from Canada. The uh, the uh, Truth and Healing uh, Commission that was formed in Canada to, to talk about and what happened in the Canadian boarding school experience, that that, that all broke loose. There's uh, thousands of bodies that was found at Kamloops was involved while we were having architectural discussions about Shawnee Indian Manual Labor School. So we felt obligated to you know talk about our kids, our missing children. So whether it's at the international uh, venue such as United Nations are also working with uh, uh, specific First Nations groups in Canada. These The, the idea is there is a cross-pollinization from north to south across that uh, medicine line of the uh, U.S.-Canadian border. Wow, that's yeah, amazing. Would, uh, Go ahead, Yvonne. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry, Omar. I would just like to add that the preservation work that we are doing at Pierce Chapel African Cemetery, of course, involves genealogy research. And we are working with a team of genealogists um, that have taken the interment lists that the descendants um, have created and doing a genealogy search forward to identify uh, descendants and family members. Um, we're hoping um, with this documentary history is to share it with a larger project, an international project um, called enslaved.org. Um, their work um, is to identify every single person that was sold into the transatlantic slave trade. And we're hoping to make a connection and fill in some of the missing gaps of information with the information that we um, research, record and document at Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. And I would like to um, just simply add, um, with the uh, genealogy research, uh, my family and I um, have taken a DNA test, which has helped me to connect with um, a relative um, that uh, is born in Nigeria. Um, and so, um, well, you know, personally, I've not um, made a personal connection with him. It helps me to make that international connection, uh, again, of confirming my DNA and my heritage amazing that's 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 awesome nancy do you have any um any stories about that no um yeah that we're actually connecting with people in japan and trying to find descendants of mr wakasa because he was a bachelor and frankly his case probably would have been created a lot more stir if he'd had a widow children to keep it alive um and so we're in touch with um japanese genealogists and um I would frankly like to go there and go into the town where he went to school and see if records can be found. And I love the way, um, um, Yamina, you brought up the Western African traditions of burial. Yeah. So I think that's a kind of repair that helps our hearts. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can tell you at uh, the trust, um, our very own Elon Cook Lee has led us with the reimagining international sites of enslavement. So we've connected some of our trust sites with sites of enslavement in other places in the world, like in the Caribbean and some sites of slave trade, like in Europe. 
And so that's been heartening to see some of that work. We actually got to go to Scotland recently to to, to visit and meet some of those folks who've been doing that work with her over the last year or so. And then also I like to remind people that, you know, you have great organizations like United Nations, which what Chief Van Barnes just mentioned, but they also under UNESCO have the International Decade of African Descent, which is from 2015 to 2024. And I'm really hoping to see many more sites and culture keepers and cultural institutions in the United States get involved with that because um, it's, it's a powerful opportunity to really tell the stories globally. So that's uh, so those are de definitely great ways we can continue this conversation transnationally. So I wanted to um, ask a question, a little bit more of a, uh, a serious question about these barriers, right? These barriers that you all have encountered. So this time I'd like to start with Nancy. If you could talk about, I mean, you've already, you kind of sussed out a little bit some of the barriers you've encountered. Um, can you talk to us about um, what strategies you have been able to use to start to address overcoming the barriers that you've encountered in doing your work? Um, I'd say that the social media has been so important in finding advocates, finding supporters, getting the word out, heightening awareness. And part of the problem with um, our case has been that the story, history has been so distorted and people have been so traumatized into silence that, you know, we're not even getting as much of the kind of powerful advocacy that we need. Um, but it's been a year and we're now, thanks to the Utah State Historical Preservation Office, holding meetings. And I think we're on a good track, but there's still so much to do. and. Um, to continue to raise awareness and finally decide what should happen to this stone. Um, you know, the site and the stone have been violently separated. Now they're out of the earth. What do you do with them? It's an ongoing question. Chief Barnes, I know you, you're dealing with different institutions and, and doing your preservation work. What have you done to overcome these boundaries and barriers? Uh, coalition building, a lot of coalition building because we can't carry, we can't carry the message to enough people. I can't travel to the places I need to be, all the places I need to speak on mm -hmm. this issue. So right. building coalitions of people, working with folks like the National Native American Boarding School Coalition and uh, just pressuring our congressional delegations as well, because we also need the federal, we need federal partners, not just the federal partners, but also our state legislative partners. And I have, we have found that if, if you just have a conversation, they understand this issue within 15 minutes of having these conversations, you know, if you can avoid the political rhetoric, the right versus left, Republican versus Democrat conversations, just talk as people. We have found allies on both sides of the party lines at state capitals and in D.C. I, I believe that sometimes you take people out of the, the, the fishbowl over here, the conversation can get a little bit easier. What about you, Yamona? Well, to echo Nancy's and uh, Chief Barnes' uh, sentiments about um, engaging the community and using social media and coalition building, uh, we've done the same thing uh, at the Hamilton Hood Foundation. We've worked with various organizations, um, various um, community uh, partners. We've worked with the National Parks Conservation Association. We've worked with National Religious for the Preservation of the Environment, um, Cultural Heritage Partners, the Buffalo Soldiers, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, FamilySearch.org. Uh, we've worked with a plethora of just um, community, community supporters and friends. Um, to help us um, and work with us to navigate, one, the lobbying, the successful lobbying of the removal of the uh, power and broadband cable lines and our days of service um, where we discover and uncover more of the history at Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. We take those days as, um, as opportunities to educate um, the youth that come and um, to educate them on the um, experience objects, the archaeological material artifacts, the various types of headstones um, um, and the white quartzite stones, the horticulture that you find at Pierce Chapel African Cemetery. Excellent, excellent work. Thank you so Mark, much. Mark, can Please, I just, Nancy, go ahead. Can I just call out the um, power of these conferences too? Oh, good. Um, because yes. 
Um, Mari Carpenter of Prairie County Connor Museum invited me to be a part of a panel about the mental and emotional trauma of, of museum collections. And she invited, and I was able to attend the Association of African American Museum Conference. And it was so awesome to be in this room of African American museum professionals who immediately got the story. And that has carried me. And, and I'm so honored to be here with everybody. And Chief Barnes, thank you so much, Yamona, everybody. Wow. Well, that's a great way to end it for me. Shout out to AAAM as a proud president of the board of directors of AAAM. I, I thank you for your endorsement, Nancy. That was great. Thank you, three, for uh, again sharing your hearts with us today. And I'd just like to wrap it up by saying, uh, the great Dr. Cornell West said it best to me. He says, justice is what love looks like in public. Let's show love to one another. Thank you. Good quotes. I hope I didn't talk too much. What?